we're here in the space of a cultural majli with the Cultural Creative Agency and I'm super happy to be in conversation with Maria Lind, um, a colleague and a friend and uh, we've worked uh, uh, together before. My name is Taos Makacheva and I'm an artist. Um, yeah, that's it. My name is Maria Lind, I'm a curator, educator and uh, writer. And currently I'm working at the Embassy of Sweden here in Moscow as the Councillor of Culture. I arrived three weeks ago, so fresh to the city. And also really happy to be here with you, Taos. Uh, we worked together most recently a year ago in uh, Timisoara in Romania, where you showed your amazing tight walk, tight rope walker video. Amazing, thank you. So I have a little um, few questions. I'm sorry I'm looking uh, at them from my phone, so at least we can start off the conversation. So Maria, how do you understand turbulence? Is it something positive or negative? My first uh, very literal experience from turbulence was not a positive one. It actually happened here, uh, flying from Moscow to Frunze in 1984, when I, as an 18-year-old, was with a group from Stockholm, Sweden, flying to Frunze on an Aeroflot flot flight, and the turbulence was incredible. We were literally jumping off our seats and the plastic hard plastic cups of Aeroflot were flowing around in the air. That was terribly, terribly frightening. So what you do in such a situation is just hold tight and look forward to the landing in a soft way. Um, my understanding of turbulence, I don't know, every time I kind of think about how I understand turbulence, I um, the grab on on the seat is definitely there, but also I think of this sensation which I'm, I've been sort of experiencing for the past few years. And it's a sensation of a suspicion that you suspect there's a constant earthquake going on that we're living through. It's like, you know, two, three point earthquake that we don't really feel physical, uh, physically, but we sort of like, but we know something is unstable. We know there are no, that we need to grab on to something. And we're constantly looking for like, I don't know, something to hold on to. And I think to me, this is like, to me, this is what, what turbulence is in a way. And this is a condition of today. And, and this condition became so much more evident in the past sort of half a year. But I don't know if it's like, I think it's just, in a way it's a condition. I can't say it's positive or negative. It's just something we're supposed to but get But if we look through. at the, the situation today, it's kind of a, a big spectrum and a lot of contrast in the sense that super dramatic things are happening, like the wildfires in Australia and currently in the US. Um, and at the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic, which a lot of the time is not so visible. Um, yeah. So you have a situation where certain things are not felt the way yeah. turbulence is supposed yeah. to be physically palpable. But on the other hand, you have overwhelmingly concrete yeah. uh, turbulence, uh, yeah. for instance, in nature. But it's also like, it's interesting, as you say, about this invisibility, because this is what was amazing in the Chernobyl TV show, that how can you show radiation yeah. that is invisible? And also, if you even think about this virus, and if you kind of, I think I was reading one sort of article, if you read a review, like, if you combine all the particles, it's a few grams yeah. around the world, mm -hmm. a few grams of single-minded cell, what like could it um, do? Yeah, so in a way I think this also speaks to a situation where we constantly swing between micro and absolute micro yeah. in that sense and macro, even yeah. going from the minutest thing connected to the earth and the processes on earth to even cosmos. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so, turbulence can be perceived as something spontaneous and unpredictable when different contexts become mixed and interwined. In this sense, is art similar to turbulence? I actually think of art more as the seismograph mm. <gasps> rather than the turbulence itself. Yeah. Because art is often detecting things yeah. long before they become visible or otherwise palpable in the world. Yeah. And, and of course that can, can be pretty dramatic uh, to show this. So the seismographic output, let's say, can, can be intense, but it's not the turbulence itself necessarily. Yeah. 
No, no, I totally agree. And I think this is uh, the seismic activity. I have actually work called Seismic Jitters, and I just did it in February, right before everything started. But I think there's this, there is this sense of sort of feeling that, um, I don't know, artists have. And I think it's very visible in Alexei Tarutz's work, which mm -hmm. was done kind of for turbulence as well. But, um, and I actually often say this phrase of like measuring the temperature of today, like measuring yeah, contemporary exactly. condition or temperature. But also on one hand, you know, you, like, like I think all of us got so many requests of like, ooh, tell us what the future is going to be like. You know, you can tell us, artists, curators, like you feel it. And at some point I was like, oh, maybe I should just make a work, like invite different type of um, fortune tellers and just ask them. And that's, and that's the what project. you did. <laughs> <laughs> and what do they say? No, no, I didn't. I, okay. I was just, it was just like, it was, it was one of my replies to this question. Uh, but you said you did a work. I did a work called Seismic Jitters, and this was done for Lahore uh, Biennial. And, but this was sli something slightly different. It was actually, I always wanted to work with objects, and there was like sort of small, um, small uh, art of metal sort of artifacts, brass. So they were quite golden, and, but they were on very small plinths with like f five millimeter legs. So every time you passed by uh -huh. or like took it, they shook, they vibrated. But also it's because I kind of understood that kind of um, the connection with material culture in Pakistan and in Lahore was very direct. So sort of in a way I knew they were gonna be like touched and moved and, and that's what I wanted. Because also the site, it was uh, in the fort and um, uh, the, what used to be Summer Palace. So it's not actually a biennial audience. It's like, it's a flow of like crazy amount of audience that saw the work, like I don't know, 10,000 a day or something. And they're not there for the biennial, they're because mm -hmm. they want to see the Lahore Fort. But kind of this, that encounter kept in mind, but conceptually it was a work, it was basically different type of cavities, architectural cavities that were sort of uh, forcefully abducted or cleaned out. There was also an audio piece, but I don't think I should narrate the work now. But maybe this also can lead us to the question of um, relationship with the audience that happened during Timishwara uh, Biennial and what it was and how it developed through several months that it took place. Yeah, so your work there, the tightrope walker or dancer, as uh, you would say in Swedish, was shown in a youth center, a huge, monumental, interesting building from the mid-70s, which today is used by young people doing all kinds of things, dance classes, music classes, um, meetings, just hanging out. And we, my co-curator and I, Anka Rujoyo, we had this as one of the venues, inserting artworks in the building where things just went on as normal. So your work was in the auditorium, constantly running when they didn't have other activities going on there. So, of course, kids and their parents who came regularly for whatever class, they would encounter these works many times during the two month uh, exhibition period or one month actually exhibition period so it was similar to the Lahore experience but with uh, yeah. less uh, people but how do you can you relate this seismic turbulence to your curatorial uh, ways or your curatorial explorations not really um, what I can identify with is when it comes to curating that difference is essential. So on the one hand, looking for patterns in terms of what is going on in art, but not just assembling as many works as possible that are as similar as yeah. possible, but to constantly play off of difference, an interesting, let's say, uh, sliding relationships, uh, contrasts, uh, etc. So any interesting curatorial project, from my perspective, is dealing with difference in an interesting way. And in difference, there is often tension. And tension mm -hmm. is, of course, connected to turbulence. Yes, tension is. Yeah. Seismic jitters. Yeah. <laughs> um, s mixing things that are different. Yeah. Yeah. So it has to start, it's the zero and one <laughs> issue again. Yeah. So th there has to be a difference and then how you uh, let that happen, how you emphasize it. Yeah. But then I think we're sort of moving on onto a question uh, of identity in a way. To me, what is interesting is at least shift in my practice that was very much concerned with identity, that was very much geographically placed 
and that now it's sort of moving into much wider conversations and 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 the question about authorship and and how much you dissolve and what happens if you dissolve completely in your practice um, is is what I'm asking in a way right now myself and experimenting with like I don't know one of my latest works was um, a, a work for uh, MCBA in Lausanne and this was very much based on the museum archive because we collected stories of how different artworks ended up in the museum and then created these fabric sculptures with uh, sort of these stories embroidered on them, you know, it was a gift of a princess, then this work left as a gift to Winston Churchill's wife, so ins and outs of the museum. So kind of in a way, like, there is some sort of desire to penetrate the museum through that work, then there is some sort of desire to kind of draw a face of the museum, but it's, it's very much detached from kind of this identity thing. But then the undercurrents of my question of how the value of the artwork is formed, which was very much in tightrope, is there. Mm. So kind of, I don't know, currents, undercurrents, overcurrents, and yeah. so on. That's well, sometimes it's artistically and curatorially super productive to just displace certain yeah. questions uh, to a different field, to a different geography, to a different yeah. uh, um, level somehow. Yeah. And of course, in your case, turbulence, could be read in, in geopolitical terms, yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess that won't go away, but things can also rest, and then one can revisit them. But how do, how do you work with identity or post-identity world in curatorially? Like? Well, because I was around already in the 90s, so I've been through a strong wave of identity politics, and. Uh, I've been invested from the beginning with uh, feminism, with gender issues, with LGBTQ issues. And anybody who has some kind of sensitivity in relation to power relations has to take all of these things into consideration. Uh, so it's always there. I wouldn't say I need to use it as a label uh, on my forehead, but it's always practiced somehow. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, ingrained, it's part of the the my I think at least it's part of my professional DNA somehow but I think it's interesting to think about the metaphors we can use both for artistic practice and, and curatorial work I don't think they're essentially extremely different but also it's not interesting for me to claim any artistic uh, legitimacy as somebody who's working curatorially so for instance the metaphor you would hear a lot today is that things are working like a compost Mm, so, yeah. uh, things, processes coming from nature have their own life, you can enhance them, you can curb them, but they actually are very active themselves. Or the old ones, you used it before yourself, stirring the stew or tossing the salad. So, how to mix certain things without flattening them. Yeah. And that's what curating is about, I think, to make the best out of art projects. And that also includes involving other art projects, particular contexts, settings, and questions that you want to ask these things at a certain point in time. And how you combine that is perhaps sometimes a bit more organic and sometimes a bit mm -hmm. more um, thought through a bit like a recipe or somebody who's mm -hmm. used to cooking and does it without a recipe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're pro compost uh, methodologically? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just double checking. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think would, would you also, I can relate to what you're saying kind of through methodologically, kind of artistically as well, because of this involvement of, mm -hmm. because I don't know, creating, for example, Shadivari, this work dedicated to circus that I've done for Yarat Foundation. We interviewed clowns, gymnasts, sort of, that are now retired, because it's like, it's so many conversations that need to be included, even in the text we're writing collaboratively. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's well, I'm gonna use your word, it's composting. Yeah, <laughs> well, you set certain things in motion. You're the one placing the different uh, ingredients, the different components there, and then they take on a life of their own. Yeah. So, and now we come to the last question, number six. Uh, how can such or any other experience of curation be used in the cultural policy on the state level? 
very interesting. And now as the Councillor of Culture, I'm of course closer to the uh, official powers. And I'm thinking of a case in Sweden where a few years ago the Minister of Culture, who then was from the Green Party, initiated a scheme for art and culture in so-called deprived areas, particularly residential areas built uh, in the 60s and 70s. And the way that this scheme was designed made her, the minister, the chief curator of the whole project. And this was new to, to that context, and I would say to Scandinavia in general. And um, it raised a lot of questions, uh, for good and for bad, how closely politicians could and should be involved. And uh, I'm thinking of it also in relation to what's happening now with the pandemic, because in a country like Sweden, politicians are not allowed to interfere. Uh, so, for instance, the decisions about uh, keeping the schools going and uh, not having um, uh, masks, etc., in Sweden, uh, comes not from the politicians, not from the government, it comes from the top civil servants within authorities dealing with health and safety. Amazing.